I'll be continuing. For the next four years. I'll be attending the University of... Uh, the University of Alabama. At the University of Notre Dame. University of LSU. University of Mississippi. Uh, college football recruiting, the tide continues to roll, signing 24 ESPN 300 recruits, the most by any team in the 14-year history of us covering recruiting. That capped quite a day for the Southeast Conference, which became the first conference to sweep the top three spots. On the end of, that end of the spectrum, not the best of days for the Pac-12, and in Los Angeles in particular, USC had its worst class of the ESPN 300 era, and UCLA nowhere to be found outside of the top 50 of the rankings. I'm Matt Schick. Welcome in to the National Signing Day post-mortem edition of College Football <laughs> Live. Matt Schick along with Jim Moore and National Recruiting Director Tom Lugabill. We spent uh, more than five hours together in a studio, so we requested uh, separate studios today. Although we did, Tom, have some fun yesterday, and some schools did have a lot of fun. Which school had the most fun? Which school was the biggest winner? I'm actually going to start out in the Pac-12. I think the job that Oregon did going all the way back to the spring, how they sustained their recruitment, sent a message to the Pac-12, really made some waves. They got faster on defense. They added their perimeter players. And then, of course, they signed the number one overall player in the country in a premium position in Kayvon Thibodeau at the defensive end spot. I just think that they are resonating right now. Uh, they're changing the landscape of recruiting and, and how it's being approached and how it's going to be done going forward. And uh, really... They really stood out as much as anybody, even though they didn't have to do a lot of work yesterday. Now, I really think it comes down to Tennessee and Florida. I think both of those teams proved that mar uh, recruiting is still a marathon. It's not a sprint. Uh, Tennessee ends up getting the big offensive tackle they needed in Darnell Wright. They cast a wide net in California, end up signing linebacker Henry Toto. I think that was important for them because it sends a message of who they are in a broader spectrum because they got to go into other people's backyards. And then the Florida Gators coach, I think the Florida Gators and Dan Mullen, the job that he did in the month of January, being able to get a defensive end in Chris Bogle, getting the, the premier remaining corner prospect in Kyer Elam, on, uh, the, uh, on February 6th tells me that the Florida Gators are reloading at the right spots and doing a really nice job. I, I agree with you, uh, Lugs, on all of that. I'll tell you, let's go back out to Oregon for a second and just, you know, think about what Mario Cristobal has done. I think what he's done is take an SEC approach to recruiting and bring it out west, and I think it's really working. And we've talked a lot about the West Coast lacking a, a big man, but he was able to go get himself some, some big guys, and we know that he's an offensive line coach by trade, so that's important to him. And then I also think you have to recognize Washington, and, and their class was, you know, it was right in there, you know, in, in the middle of the pack but but I think you have to count the quarterback transfer Eason in this class because mm -hmm. he's a guy that's going to see the field now he's been there for years so he knows their system but taking over for Jake Browning and I love Jake Browning he's a, he's a heck of a college football player but this guy's going to take him to another level uh, but the SEC just continues to dominate and, and you and I talked about this yesterday quite extensively it starts with a top-down attitude and that's the regents or the president or, or the, the board of regents who, whoever it may be the chancellor that says hey you know what we are going to be a great football program here because that is the window. That's the front porch to our school. That is the, the, the thing that's going to give us the most visibility. It's going to put us on TV. It's going to give us free advertising. And you see that throughout the SEC. And I think that's one of the reasons, that commitment from the top down, that you're seeing a domination not only on the football field, but also in the recruiting landscape. Let's, that's in the SEC. Let's go back out west where you started your, your comments there, Jim. Tough day for the Pac-12. Just seven teams were ranked in the top 50 in terms of classes. That's tied for the fewest among the Power Five conferences. Jim, you coached out at UCLA. What is wrong with the Pac-12? Well, you know, I just praised a couple teams, but they've got an image issue. Number one, they're, they're not on TV a lot. Number two, they're not winning big games. They're not getting into the college football playoffs. They're not getting the premier players. And I think maybe most importantly, teams like Ohio State and Alabama and now Tennessee, uh, Notre Dame, they're coming in and they're taking the premier players out of the state of California or from the West Coast. There was a West Coast team yesterday that lost a kid out of their own backyard who, who went from a Southern California school to, to Kansas State. That didn't didn't happen in the old days. 
Yeah, I think one thing to follow there, too, is the big guys that we continually talk about, that you build your championship roster around, offensively and defensively, up front. You just don't have those bodies in your recruiting pool on the West Coast, so it creates real challenges. And the Polynesian kids that have been a big part of that contingency, if they start looking elsewhere, that furthers the problem for the Pac-12 right now. Uh, let's go to the ACC, where after not getting a quarterback in the 2018 class, Florida State head coach Willie Taggart attempted to get one in the 2019 class. That was derailed when Sam Howell from North Carolina decommitted or chose, I should say, North Carolina over FSU. And then he didn't get one yesterday. Someone, another quarterback committed to Maryland instead of Florida State. And that comes on the heels of DeAndre Francois being dismissed from the team. Willie Taggart on Wednesday said all is well. We have a plan, uh, I think a pretty good plan. Uh, I don't necessarily want to discuss it right now, but I think we got a pretty good plan on, on where we, where we want to go. Uh, we've had this plan in place. After today, we executed it, and we got to continue to grow. We need more depth at the position, obviously. I think um, when you look at the transport portal and, and grad transport, there's always options for us, but it's, I think it's more important to get the right kind of guy in here, especially at that position, and not just go get any anybody Jim Mora are you confident in Willie Taggart's plan no no I hope he has a plan he better have a plan other otherwise he has a problem and, and like Luke's talked about Florida and, and you know the, the optimism around there there's a pessimism surrounding Florida State they've got an image problem right now and not getting a quarterback in two consecutive classes you can't you can't overstate the importance of that yeah, and Coach, you know, not just not signing a quarterback in two consecutive classes, but having a chance at two kids that had not committed, both go in another direction. The one young man decides to go to Ole Miss and John Rice Plumley, and the other, as you mentioned, Matt, goes to, to Maryland. So now you're left with the transfer portal. So who does that leave you? Maybe Josh Jackson out of Virginia Tech? Because you're going to have to get somebody that can play right away. Transfer portal is not going to help Florida State with a guy that's still got to sit out. Typically, you know, you use the transfer portal to supplement your program, not right. to build your program. And so if you're going to keep going to that well for the quarterback, I don't know how you build your program in the way that you want it to look. Well, we'll see if uh, Florida State can get a quarterback from the transfer portal. The transfer portal is where a top five player from last year's cl class resided for eh, about 24 hours or so. Alabama linebacker Iabi Enoma put his name in the database, but then Nick Saban broke the news with us on Wednesday that Enoma was no longer in the portal. I asked Saban what he thought of the new system that allows players easier access to transfer. I do think it gives players options. Uh, but I also think that uh, we want to make sure that we're not uh, putting decision making in people's hands that may not be in the best position to make those decisions sometimes in terms of what's in their best interest. Tom, are you okay with easier access for players to transfer like the portal? Not entirely, not as it currently state, it, it sits right now. I think there needs to be some tweaks to it. Um, I don't like how it's open-ended. Um, you know, I like Nick Saban's comments right there in regards to Yabe and Oma. That was a nice way of saying, quit listening to the people that shouldn't have anything to do with this decision that are telling you, oh, you're, you know, you're getting hosed or you're not playing or you're better than that and you should go here and you should go there. That's exactly what Nick Saban is really saying. So I just think, I think the whole process just needs to be thought out a little bit more thoroughly, uh, both from a, a coaching perspective and a player perspective, uh, Coach Mora. Well, like usual, Nick brings it right back to where it should be, and that's to the player and to the practicality of the system. And uh, the player should listen to the coach. And I, I know there might be this perception that the coach just wants you to stay in the program, but that's not always the case. I think most coaches that I've been around want the, what's in the best interest of the player. And, and Nick, he, he's someone that, that should be listened to, and obviously he was listened to in this case, and I think that it'll end up panning out for this young man. Transferring is something that uh, quarterbacks have been doing at a rapid pace. Look at some of yeah. the big names that have decided to go from one school to another. Hertz, uh, Kelly Bryant, Justin Fields, Brandon Wimbush, Jacob Beeson. 2013-2014, those two classes combined, 72% of the quarterbacks that signed with a Power 5 school did not finish their careers with the school they signed with. Lugs, why are so many quarterbacks transferring? There can only be one. Uh, that's number one. Number two, 
I don't think we have the level of competitive temperament that we used to have. Nobody wants to earn anything anymore. If it doesn't work out immediately, I'm out of here. If, if it doesn't go your way immediately, then you get disgruntled. Um, redshirting has become an afterthought. You know, Coach will tell you, it used to be you redshirted everybody. Quarterbacks, you'd love to redshirt quarterbacks. You'd love to not have to put them on the field for two, two and a half years. That's not reality. These kids want to get on the field right now. Whether they're ready to or not, that's the world that we're living in. And so they're looked to find other destinations. But then you got an example like Brock Purdy, Coach, at Iowa State that got beat out in training camp. He decides to go to work and earn it and fight and scrap and ends up leading Iowa State to a remarkable year and a 6-1 and one record by sticking yeah, it out. Yeah, you respect that. I respect yeah. that. I, 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 but I also understand, you know, a lot, of class, a lot of times you sign two quarterbacks in your class understanding that one will probably transfer. Yeah. Uh, and if you're a big-time program, you're going after the big-time player, you'd love them to have that competitive temperament that you're talking about. But if there's a system change, they don't fit necessarily uh, in the culture, uh, you're going to see, and we've seen it in history, we've seen quarterbacks transfer. And, and and, uh, and it's helped a ton of them, and it'll help Eason and Washington this year. Yeah, not all transfers are created equal. Everyone's got their own reasons, but it is happening in droves, and it shows no signs of stopping. Neither do we on college football live transferring, not just relegated to the players. Coaches can do it, too. They just don't have to sit out, and they get paid a little bit more. Dana Hogerson joins us next. College Football Live is brought to you by Kay Jeweler. Dana Holgerson earned career victory number 61. Only the legendary Don Neela won more games at West Virginia. When the wind gets blowing, man, it, you, you, the hair becomes a, like a tour de force. It gets, uh, gets a little crazy, gets a little wild. Dana having a beverage while his offense rests. I said, how many is that? He said, this is about my fifth so far. Dana Holgerson, West Virginia coach, is on his way to Houston. I think it's a huge coup to be able to bring a coach from the Power Five. Go Cougs. Hey, y'all want to go win some games? Let's go win some games. Ellie, sat down the uh, the Red Bull long enough to chat with us here for a few minutes. Dana Holgerson, the head coach of the Houston Cougars. Uh, Dana, appreciate the time here on College Football Live. Why did you ultimately decide to leave West Virginia for Houston? Well, because I had an opportunity to do so is the, is the main thing. Uh, didn't take me long to figure out that uh, University of Houston is a great place to be. You know, Houston's a great place to be. You got unlimited potential here and uh, excited about being here. No, Coach, when you arrived, obviously recruiting is your first and foremost priority. What type of advantages have you had given this, the, the fact that if you wanted to, you probably don't have to get on an airplane to recruit greater Houston and some of the surrounding areas. How much did that help you? Yeah, it's, it's helped a lot. I've been in about 60 high schools between Houston, Texas, and New Orleans, Louisiana. So, and, and, and I didn't, it didn't involve an airplane. I didn't go anywhere uh, at West Virginia that didn't involve an airplane. So that, that, that definitely helps. I got great respect and admiration for all the high school coaches here in the state of Texas, and especially Houston. Uh, and Louisiana is not a bad neighbor as well. So yeah, that made, that made a difference when it comes to getting out and doing what we got to do. Coach, this is Jim Mora. How you doing? Good, Jim. Good. Hey, I'll, we all have some crazy recruiting stories. You have any good ones from the road this year? Well, yeah, it's a lot of food. <laughs> all recruiting stories involve food. Every <laughs> meal is the best meal you've ever especially had. Especially in it? Houston. <laughs> yeah. Everyone. Yeah, and it doesn't matter if it's in a home or if you. If you just happen to have some late night uh, 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 Cajun food in, in Houston and New Orleans and in all of Louisiana as well. So food's definitely the topic that we always talk about. <laughs> Coach, it, coming from the Power Five to, to the Group of Five to Houston, you've seen, you've been a part of it, you've been outside of it, now you're back in with Houston. The way the college football playoff is constructed, do you envision a, a scenario where a Group of Five in this 14 playoff gets in? Well, you, you, you like talking about the Power Five and Group of Five more than I do. I don't understand the difference, honestly. I was, uh, I was you know, the last uh, coach that took a Group of Five to, to the Power Five, and it was an easy transition. We had a lot of success at West Virginia. I was very proud of what we accomplished at West Virginia. Uh, Houston's no different than, than that. You know, it's the jobs are the jobs, and you recruit the way you can recruit. Uh, the American Athletic Conference is, is full of, uh, you know, really good teams that are knocking on the door. And, uh, you know, Houston's going to be one of those teams here moving forward. Well, and the reason you, we asked that question is because UCF, part of the American, ran the table and you felt 
maybe some felt that it should have been in the college football playoff in a four-teamer. It did whatever it could do uh, and controlled what it could control and win all of its games and still wasn't in. Is that a concern? No, it's really not a concern at all. There's a lot of a lot of teams that have the same argument, whether they're in the SEC, Big 12, Big 10, ACC, or or the Pac-12 as well. It's just look, you got to do your job. You got to do the best job that you possibly can. Uh, recruit the right right way. Build your roster the right way. Try to win as many games as you possibly can, and and and, and let the chips fall where they do. I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen with the CFP moving forward. You know, yeah. you guys like to talk about this a whole bunch more than I do. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, just as far as what's going to happen in the future, I don't think anybody knows. Uh, Coach, obviously your brand of football on the offensive side is, is very exciting, and you're going to have a dynamic playmaker uh, athletically under center in, in this scheme. Just how excited are you to have that type of player, and what does that mean for this offense and what will be the 2019 iteration at Houston? Yeah, I'm looking forward to coaching Derek King. You know, I, I, I've really only met with him a couple of times. I've been here five weeks and we really haven't been able to meet. Started to get to, to work with him here this past week and, and we'll do here in about an hour as well. But uh, really a dynamic player. Uh, you know, he's, he's been around uh, Houston. Uh, he's been around the University of Houston, Houston High School. He played at Manville High School uh, and, and won, a, won a state championship. Won a lot of games, played a lot of football. Yeah. You know, you mentioned under center. We're actually going to do that a little bit. You know, I mean, oh. we're not going to be just a up tempo, no huddle, <laughs> uh, shotgun team like like you think we are. We're going to do all kinds of things. You know, we're we're going to be very multiple with what we do on offense. And he's a very intelligent football player, and he'll be able to handle anything that we throw at him. And, and quickly, coach, what's his health status after that meniscus injury? No, oh, really good. I, it, it was uh, it was an uh, easy uh, recovery. He's he's full yeah. go right now. Uh, we got we got five weeks of off season conditioning right now, and he's he's going to do everything moving forward. We, I hear we have a spring break in about five weeks. I, the kids will probably take it. I won't. But then we'll get we'll get into uh, spring football after that. He's full go right now. I wish we could go out okay. there and and practice right now, but we got a lot of work to do before that. All right. Appreciate the time here again, opening up with Oklahoma, but a lot of time between now and then. Dana, thank you much for the time. Appreciate that. Dana, Dana Holgerson, the head coach of the Cougars. Up next, other news outside of Houston and recruiting. A couple of former coaches trying to get back into the coaching ranks. Only one was successful in doing so. Is brought to you by Mountain Dew. Do the do. I will make a statement. You tell me whether it's inbounds or out of bounds. Kyler Murray today announced he will attend and compete in the NFL scouting combine. Jim Mora, this statement. Kyler Murray is a franchise quarterback in the NFL. Kyler Murray has the, the ability to be a franchise quarterback as long as he can overcome his height. But I think if he's in the right system with the right coach calling the right plays that takes advantage of his extreme athleticism and his great competitiveness, he can be. I think he's a franchise talent. My only concern is the length of the season and durability given his measurable standard. All right, that's one foot in, I guess. Inbounds, out of bounds. You're kind of both toeing the line there. Uh, Bob Stoops, 58 years old, introduced today as the GM and head coach of Dallas franchise in the XFL. <laughs> Luke, you coached in this league. Is he a good fit? Boom. Inbounds, Go out get bounds. one of those big Big Bob, big game Bob, get you one of those. Yes. I, I think hey. he's going to have a blast. I really do. When you get to manage and put together a roster, there's a lot of good football players that are out there. There's football that wants to be watched by fans when it's not the fall. I think this is going to be an exciting move. This is a big hire for Oliver Luck. He's a ball coach. He wants to coach ball. Hey, he'll yep. be as competitive as he's ever been, but they won't. he won't have the stress that he had right. at Oklahoma. So let's see how he does. I'm sure he'll do well, and let's see if it leads to something bigger and better for him. And he'll have summers off so he can golf league starts in January, <laughs> February. You don't get summers off, dude. Well, maybe. Uh, you would know. Uh, after Art Bryles was denied the opportunity to be a candidate and get that offensive coordinator position at Southern Miss by the higher-ups and university leadership, Art Bryles will never coach again. Lugs, inbounds or out of bounds? Uh, out of bounds. Inbounds if you say college football. I okay. think he'll find a place to coach somewhere, maybe overseas, uh, some, some way, shape, or form. But in today's social climate, how is an AD, how is a president, how is a board of brush going to feel about that when their coach wants to, uh, to interview him? 
I think he needs to focus on the professionals as well. I think that yep. there's a spot for a guy like this. His creativity, his passion, his competitiveness, uh, it's going to be really hard for him to get back in the college game. All right, we'll end with this. We've seen some signing day shenanigans before, but how about Gavin Potter, uh, Potter three-star linebacker out of Oklahoma, comes to his signing day news conference with a Kansas State hoodie and then a Texas Tech shirt, takes them both off, and he's painted the chest. KU Blue, Rock Chalk, Lugs, inbounds or out of bounds? Out of bounds. I just uh -oh. think I don't I just think it's disrespectful to the individual that spent all that time recruiting you. And um, I don't like it. I agree. And, and I don't like his parents sitting there endorsing it either. I, look, let's just show some humility and let's be gracious that we even got an offer. And, and yeah. let's respect KU as well as the other two teams that he disrespected. All right. All right. And while you're at it, uh, get off our lawn. <laughs> by the way. That's right. By the way, he will get along with less smiles. I think that's safe to assume. Uh, Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN2. We're back on College Football Live. Thanks for watching the Thursday edition.